Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Three Men of Football podcast. Hello, lads. Even Thomas, Simon, how are we? Hi, lads. How are we doing? Good, good, good. Oh, good. How are we feeling? Uh, yeah. Have you seen, did you see the image this week of um, Balotelli with the top over his head? Why always me? No. So, you know, we did it in Man City yeah. when he was getting all the crap off the media. But just yeah. before we went live then, obviously, Thomas has just done the Balotelli. Why always me? He has, yeah, and yeah. Dan's response was? <laughs> yeah, because it I always wonder. is. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. <laughs> You're a liability. To be we honest, just... I, I hold this shit together. <laughs> <laughs> we were just oh saying this podcast is either going to go from strength to strength or end up in court, and we're yeah. never sure from week to week what's going to happen. Either way, it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of a lot of fun, uh, the Billy Birch podcast has gone down well. Yes. The man, the myth, the legend. Yeah. And we've had a couple of death threats as well. So that's gone down extremely well. <laughs> From local teams. <laughs> From local <Not> teams. <laughs> Thomas, you sent three in. <laughs> hey, apparently because really. he didn't sign you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's gone down really well. Feedback has been brilliant. Uh, people are a little bit worried about Billy because by the end of it, he was doing this because he had another ciggy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> apparently he was on 84 patches for that hour and a half just oh, to try and control brilliant. himself. Yeah, he did a great job, but that man can talk. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Well, to be fair, I thought we did a good job, but we just sat back for an hour and a half and said, off you go, Bill. Enjoy yourself. I did see an, uh, a mention on Facebook. I thought Darren could talk, but Billy takes the biscuit. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he was in his element, though, wasn't he? Put a mic in front of him and away he goes, especially when he was telling all the story about uh, when he was a referee. And Ferguson and, and all that palaver. He was hilarious. Did, Kept talking did, about the Manchester Mafia. Did someone put up a um, a clip on Facebook? Or did, did someone cut it? They out? did. They did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of all the Man United players yeah. running over to him in the corner. Yeah, yeah. I think it was Keane, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, it was good to see the Penguins back interacting on Facebook. He is, but he was right. It was definitely outside the area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was, yeah, was that a penalty? By about 12 yards. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's been hammered about that this week. Yeah. Uh, but he was he was definitely good value. Uh, really good fella to get on. You know, he knows us really well, but he knows the, the Liverpool football scene uh, better than most. And also, having been around a professional game as well, it's, it's good to get a, a perspective from someone who's been in both games. Yeah, yeah, um, really good. And the crappy referee as well. So. Oh, he's awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, listen, we, uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happened at the weekend. Did anything uh, happen, Si? Any controversy? There's a couple of games, but we'll, yeah. we'll walk through it, Daz. And <laughs> then uh, what we're also going to do today is review uh, the weekend coming up as well, um, because we'll get this out on Friday as a single episode. Um, but we'll kick off with, with comments. Uh, and obviously, they're all leaning towards Billy Birch. The first one, great podcast, lads. Really enjoyed listening to my old teammate, Birchie. It brought back some great memories of players and teams, and that was from William Butterworth. Oh, brilliant, Collins Billy. Our fella. Yeah. Yeah. Um, boss fella. Uh, but he played with Billy in the same team as Billy for years, so he really enjoyed it. Um, probably the best one was my old fella phoning me up right in the middle of watch it, watching it. He was on 40 minutes. He's like, Do you know what? I've always hated Billy Birch. <laughs> but I'm actually really enjoying this. <laughs> 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 yeah, he said he really is a legend, isn't he? So I, I think he's all right. I feel as though we're bringing people together, Simon, on this yeah, podcast yeah. as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know whether we're ever going to bridge that gap. Give that half an hour. <laughs> we back to he sent me off three games in a row. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one came from Mark Fullerton, who's a, a, a guy I used to work with. Um, he's a big Liverpool fan as well. Great listen, lads. I thought you boys don't half talk. Billy takes it to another level. <laughs> yeah, he was uh, he was unbelievable. And then Mick Wickham, who was another good mate of ours and, and was the assistant manager to Billy when he ran the old Zabs team that Dad and I played in. Thoroughly enjoyed it, lads. Some great memories, but he didn't mention that I was in the side that beat them in the semi-final of the Junior Cup early 80s. Yeah, he seemed to skim over that quite was a it, bit. It's really it? funny. He went into all sorts of detail, but missed out some of the things where we could have taken the piss. <laughs> and then the last one. Uh, which is from today is Happy Birthday, Darren. I imagine the two other BGs will be singing Happy Birthday on the next episode. 
So what I want to know is, what BGA are you? And who are we? I'd have to be um, Barry Gibb. No, shut up. Is he the one with the beard? Yeah, in the world of beards. <laughs> he believes in that. Yeah. Goes without saying, surely. Who's the ones that's... Did they all storm off? Remember the um, Channel 4 presenter, uh, Clive Anderson? Yeah. Did they all storm off his TV show once? That could be us. We could do that. Yeah. I was saying on... Um, I put a post up on, on Facebook yesterday because I was watching uh, the game and the uh, analysts were Michael Owen, Rio Ferdinand and Crouchy. I mean, they're all good people. But we definitely could have made it a lot more interesting. It was boring. Yeah. Absolutely boring. Do you know what it is, though, with, with all three of them? Um, <coughs> Crouchy, once he's almost let go of his shackles, is quite funny. Yeah. I'm not sure the other two are. Michael Owen, unfortunately, doesn't have a, an entertaining voice, if you like. Ferdinand gets overexcited. Well, Crouchy's actually quite funny. Some of his podcast stuff is really good. But I see what you mean. I don't, I don't want to listen to those three. Give well, me Thomas did, Morris any day of the week. Someone did point out, well, I pointed out that it would be difficult trying to control Thomas. And someone pointed out that we could turn it into a three-hour show between us, but uh, I think that would be all down to Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a little bit unfair, boys. A little bit unfair again. This was the last word, that's... Can't get Always. away uh, The thing no, is, but... Si, he might drop us for, for a game on Saturday. Yeah, we have to be careful, don't we? Sorry, boss, it was all size fault. I don't know whether he'll do that because it's your birthday, though, Daz. How old are you? I, I, I know you don't release this type of information. No, no. To no, our no, friends, there's only our friends listening. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I try not to, uh, to tell people, but I asked my kids today in school, year three, so what, seven years of age, six, seven, eight years of age, and then... Um, they gave me a range, anything from the good kids were 21, 21. The little well, guests were... Did they a, have a white stick and a Labrador? They, they did. And once Labrador shut up, I could hear them. <laughs> and and the, uh, the, the kids who aren't great, who are going to get some hassle when we go back after half term, 110. Oh, so nice. that's the age range I'm looking at. They uh, might have I, seen you play football. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm going for around about 45. Ah, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel older, mostly I mean, on a Saturday night. You're still 10 years younger than Thomas. I mean, yeah. I think he looks good for 55, but, you know, that's just the reality, isn't it? And when he shaves, he looks really, really older. young. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the baby on this, boys. So you know that. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, uh, what have you done today, Dad? Been in school? Yeah, bit of work in school today. Uh, kid, kids were great. Uh, you know, I work in a really great school uh, the kids are amazing and uh, so we had a really good day with them and then uh, I finished a bit early so I got home about half four and then I went to see uh, mum and dad now what's interesting I walked into mum and dad's no. and uh, I, I'm, I'm them, what the, <laughs> <I'm>, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah I could. mum and dad you just went in the other room to see them <laughs> listen to this I'm now the fifth son because <laughs> Paul, obviously, number one, still course, still yeah. number one, yeah. But it feels like it's a top ten every every month. Coming in at number two is our friend Sean. McCusker. Sean McCusker's coming in at number two in, in the uh, the Jeff Partington Wall of Sons. Can't believe it. Where was and he then, sat? Then? What's that? Where was he sat? He was sat, Thomas, you know, I've mentioned this on a hair before when I mentioned it off camera, in my chair. Oh. He was sat in my chair, and my dad's loving it. He's laughing at his jokes. My mum's sharing cups of tea with him. To be fair, it was a disgrace. If I'm honest with you, it was a disgrace. It was my birthday. They came in and went, yeah, help yourself. No, I'm like, <laughs> ridiculous. Number three, Sai. Number three coming in at number three. Thomas? Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Jeff coming likes in him. at number three. I think Jeff feels sorry for him, though. <laughs> I'm not sure. I did, I did mention to me that he might get a grant for working with Thomas and talking to him, but I'm not yeah. sure it's come through. <laughs> it's a weekly <laughs> wage. <laughs> so then, and then, number four, he's only been in the family six months, possibly. Joey Holmes. That's brilliant. I love that. Joey Holmes. I mean, there's talk of Christmas Day. I'm not happy with it. I'll be honest oh. with you, lads. I like my Christmas day nice and chilled. At the moment, Thomas is round and Sean. Terrible, mate. Listen, you come round to ours, we'll look after you. 
Thanks, mate. Thanks. <laughs> Stay away from them all. <laughs> brilliant. Well, listen, we're making your birthday much brighter anyway. Look after you on your birthday while we yeah. do a podcast. Because I was. Uh, well, exactly. I was invited out tonight. Where uh, to? to well, are we going to go out within lockdown? With friend, oh, just for a walk around the park. But I've ah. been told by the police I can't do that. No. Um, <laughs> Uh, but they said you're going to spend it with, with some friends. I went, no, Simon and Thomas. That's what I'm spending it with. <laughs> <laughs> two of my best friends. That's harsh. That's two best friends. That's what we are, lads. We're two <laughs> best friends. <laughs> oh, genius. All right, well, listen, we, we wish you a happy birthday, Dan. We don't care how old you are. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, so let's get on to uh, the, the games from the weekend because it was a... I want to say interesting, um, somewhat crappy for Liverpool fans, um, but uh, but it was there was a lot of activity and action over the weekend. So the first game on Saturday was the big game for us, which was Everton versus Liverpool. Finished two two. Keane and DCL scored for Everton, and Mane and Salah scored for Liverpool. But obviously there are a lot of talking points. Daz, what are you thinking about this game, mate? What, how, how did you feel about it? I, I felt, um, one, I got the result right. Just want to put that out there. Uh, I thought Liverpool started off really well. I thought uh, they came out the traps, if you like, passed the ball quick. It, it was almost like um, them getting beat by Villas, giving them the right kick up the backside. And, and they needed it. And they came out. And Mane, again, is, is a difference. He, he makes the difference. Uh, great goal. Um, but actually, I think as the game went on, Everton started to get get into it, um, and obviously we had the incident, which are, we're going to probably talk in depth. Which one? I've, well, well, yeah, there was a few, but but the, the the Virgil Van Dijk one, I think, in Pickford's been taken out of all proportion, and I think actually what it shows is the hatred people have. We used to have banter in this city, and we used to have people having a laugh and a joke, and it was gone. But what I've seen on social media has been an absolute joke. Um, Pickford did not, and, and I don't care what to say, did not go out to intentionally hurt Virgil van Dijk. He went out to try and, and, and stop him from scoring. And, and he did do that. The, the, the unfortunate thing is, and I'm a massive Virgil van Dijk fan, I, I think he's a brilliant centre-half, right up there with the best that I've ever seen. And that includes some of the players I've played with. Um, he's, he's absolutely brilliant. But what happened was just a freak accident. Absolute freak accident. It's a big loss for Bull, yeah. Nothing else. The, the issue then comes down to should he have got sent off or not Pickford? It's a difficult one, to, but I think... Uh, I watched Dermot Gallagher on Sky Sports give his interpretation of it, and he said something along the lines of... Um, they thought it was a pen, so they went to look at the offside. The VAR decided it was offside, so therefore it nulls the pen. What they didn't do then, and, and Dave McAllen came out and said this was the human error in the whole problem, was that they didn't go and see if it was a reckless enough challenge to warrant a booking or a sending off. And, and that's where it basically it, it lies down to. VAR is never the problem. The interpretation of the VAR is the problem. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was clumsy, and, and, and that, I, I personally feel that's all it was. It was clumsy. It was a stupid tackle. Um, that he, he probably didn't need to make, but I think he's honestly gone to make himself big and his momentum took him through. Virgil has put his, uh, stretched his leg out and he's landed on his knee, so he's injured him. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it, the, the offside nullifies the penalty. It's definitely a red card because that, if, if that is not a red card, then what that means is something can have, happen on the pitch, the ball can go out to play. And then someone can just go and kick an opponent up in the air and not and be done. That's that's not the way it works. So it should be a red card. But once the red card is not given, you know, you you're not happy about it for an hour or so, and then you get over it and you get on with it. Some of the stuff that's gone on since is just absolutely ludicrous and makes the normal Liverpool fans just look ridiculous. It's embarrassing. It's absolutely embarrassing what's going on. I agree. I to be honest, I. As you both know, I get a little bit excited when I'm watching Liverpool and jump around, scream and shout and, and whatnot. And I was, after the game, I was really angry over the decisions that were made. Not about the challenges, because 
even though the Charlesons was a ridiculous challenge, that type of thing happens. People are late and he hasn't purposely gone to do Thiago. It was just a really late, bad challenge. It was a forwards challenge coming back into midfield and it, it, it wasn't great. Pickford's the same. He's, he, he's come out, rushed out. He's closed his eyes and just jumped like a big staff. He's trying to do a smichael and just look stupid, nowhere near the ball and just took Van Dijk out. He hasn't intentionally gone to do him in. But what I was angry over afterwards was the fact that the decisions affected and are going to affect us for the rest of the season. And after the game, I was wound up for a few hours and then I did start seeing the stupid nonsense that was put on uh, mm-hmm. social media. And I thought, you know what, that's just ridiculous. And then I looked and watched it again and watched the challenges and, and seen actually what happened. And that ends at the nail on the head. It is human error. It's human error, not just for the Van Dijk one. I believe the the offside as well at the end of the game is human error. But going back to the actual game, I thought it was a great game. Yeah, me too. Uh, both sides, quality, mm. aggressive on the ball, aggressive off the ball. Uh, both sides were really brave, leaving openings for the other and, and mm. leaving isolating players at times. Liverpool, like you say, started off in a house on fire. I thought Andy Robinson was superb in the game going forward. He caused Everton no end of problems right across. And Mane is just absolutely on fire. What a guy, what a player. Uh, he's outstanding. And then when Liverpool did drop off a little bit and Everton got in, I never ever felt worried that Liverpool weren't in the game or in any kind of trouble. We always seemed to be bossing the game. We, we were determining the tempo of the game pretty much right the way through and always seemed to be on top. And Everton got the two equalisers in the game. I still thought, do you know what? I don't actually feel worried. I think we're going to... There's opportunities there. We're creating opportunities. We're creating... We're pulling Everton apart to create space to give us another got another chance for a goal. And then we got that goal at the end, which was, you know, is very dubious uh, as to whether or not he was offside. And then I went away really disappointed, thinking that's a game that we've dropped points in that we didn't need to. Uh, and that's me last in the last few days that's what I've been mm. thinking more about rather than the injuries and the disappointments of losing Van Dyke for the season and uh, whatever else has gone, has gone on I'm more disappointed about the dropping of the points when we actually were the better team we, we controlled most of the game and we created really good chances and we, we just didn't we just didn't score to be honest we didn't yeah. score the goals that we should have you're, you're right and, and I think that's the, the lasting memory that, that you're left with but I think you're right to focus on how good the game was as well. That's the first derby where there's been really something on it for a while. And two teams that are going after each other as well. I, I thought we we had we were we had the better of the game and probably should have won it. But only edged it because I thought Everton played really well. Again, you've got uh, Calvert Lewin pop up popping up in, in places where he should be popping up. They're doing it right, they're playing well. Rodriguez did really well in the game. Um, I thought Thiago was outstanding in the game. Some of his passing is, is ridiculous. But the other thing, one other thing, and I don't want to hang around too much on, on this because we could talk about the, the Liverpool-Everton game all day. But the one other thing that, that stood out from an Everton perspective was the Robinson kick out in the middle of the park. <clears throat> so at the time, I didn't even notice it. And then when they replayed it, he kicked out. Now... I don't know whether the VAR or the, the, the referee has interpreted it that he's fallen and his leg has kicked out. But, I mean, if that, if that was a, an Everton player, we'd be shouting that he's kicking out. I, I agree. I didn't see it in normal time. No, um, I didn't see that. No, but, but I do think that's where VAR... What you said before, Sai, actually, was, was quite right. That, uh, Pickford should have um, been sent off for that. Um, because I think... You look at dangerous play. Did he mean it? No, but it's still dangerous play. Mm. Same as Robinson should have went because he's kicked out and he's intended to kick out. And, and that, that word intention is really important, I think. Um, but I, just on the game, though, I have to say I thought that was the best derby in the last five, six, maybe seven years because I think both teams decided to go for it um, as, as best they could. I think what's interesting now is what happens to both Liverpool and Everton. I think... You know, uh, what, what do Everton do now? We've got a couple of injuries coming up this weekend. We'll talk about that later on. But what do Liverpool do? I've seen it in the press today. There's a guy from, uh, I think it might have been Brighton. They're going after, possibly. Um, and Brighton don't want less than 50 million. And I'm like, 50 million for a stopgap centre-half, possibly. 
Uh, is, oh, it ben White? is it Ben White? Yeah, Ben White. Yeah, ben White. Fabinho is a, is a, is a solid centre-half. I'd, I'd have him there, no problem at all. He's played five games. They've kept four clean sheets while he's been playing centre-half. And in all of those games, he's been the best player on the park. I think that's a no-brainer, given the fact that we're now overloaded a bit in midfield as well. I'd, yeah. I'd give him a go at centre-half and get him playing in there with Gomez and get Matip back in when he's, uh, when he's fit. But for now, Fabinho's your answer. Surely. Yeah. Thomas. Anyway, let's 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 uh, let's jump past this because we could hang around on this forever um, because we we enjoy talking about it and there's so much other stuff going on. The second game was another cracker, Chelsea and Southampton three three. Yeah. So then we've been given Chelsea crap about the fact that people like Werner and Havertz haven't been playing that well, and Lampard has found it difficult to make it all gel because there's so many different personalities there, big players, world class but all perceived world-class players just not playing well together. Then they go up in this game. Werner scores two, Havertz scores one. Actually, Havertz scored later in the game. Um, but then uh, Ing scored, uh, that's Shea Adam scored a really scrappy goal and then Vestergaard scored to, to make it 3-all. I mean, that, what a game that was as well. And Chelsea looked an awful lot better, even though I, I, I think Southampton did well in the game. Chelsea did so much better than that game. Their, their formation was better. The way they interacted with each other was better, but again, Southampton did well. Yeah, but, I agree. I thought uh, they were they were going forward. They looked they looked electric at times. Uh, I really liked the way Chilwell got past the midfield and, and was more like an Andy Robinson pushing on. Uh, he should, could have scored early on to make it one nil, and then Werner uh, used his skill and his pace, turned their centre half clean through a couple of times. He looked he looked really tidy. Uh, Going forward, I don't think they're going to have a problem this season, but they were totally disjointed across the pitch. People not knowing what they were doing or didn't know the roles. And then individual mistakes, which has happened since the first game for Chelsea, has really done them. And the fact that the goalie was out injured and he had to put uh, the Spanish lad in, I can't, I can't say his name. Uh, but, Juan. They... <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he cocked up again as well as Kurt Zuma for, for that goal for Che Adams. So they've got a few liabilities there in the side. And when they tie, the, tie them down, I think Chelsea will you know, improve and, and start. But going getting... forward, they were, they were much better, weren't they? Yeah, very good. But, but what they did do is Frank, uh, Frank changed. I say Frank's so overknown. Frank uh, changed Werner to play a more central role. Yeah. And I think that was a massive, uh, had massive impact on how they played then because they used Werner's pace better than they had done previously because he was right on the last man. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing about Thomas brought about um, mistakes again, the amount of poor defending we're seeing at the moment in the Premier League was shocking. Zuma should have cleared it out. Then the keeper should have went through the ball and, and, and cleared it out. And then Shea Adams somehow managed to get a scrappy goal. Fair play to him, he never gave up. But uh, fair play to Southampton to, uh, to get back in the game. And, and uh, then it's just a side Southampton. They're going to be one of them up and down roller coaster sides, and they'll get some results. You're thinking, where'd they get that from? And they'll get beat by teams like who were near the bottom. Yeah. That's just what they are at the moment, Southampton. I totally agree. But it, and it wasn't the only it wasn't the only high scoring game or the big comeback. There, there was others in the in the weekend as well. But that was a really good game. I thought that was the best Chelsea game I've seen in a while because I thought they were they were really good going forward. The next game we thought was going to be an absolute cracker. Oh, actually, before we go on to that, so the scores we had for um, Everton-Liverpool, I had 3-1 Liverpool, Thomas had 3-1 Liverpool, and Darren had 2-2. Well done, Daz. For Chelsea-Southampton, I had 2-1 Chelsea, Thomas had 2-0 Chelsea, and Darren had 4-1 Chelsea. So yeah, all I, wrong. yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, all <laughs> wrong. Um, <laughs> But the next game was Man City and Arsenal. So we thought that this was going to be a decent game, and we talked about this quite a lot. It ended up being 1-0 to uh, Man City. And I think, if, if I remember rightly, we were talking about the fact that Man City didn't have much of a scoring threat. And their goals were either going to come from Sterling or Mares, and Sterling scored the winner. Um, what do you think about that game, Tom? Uh, to be honest, I was really disappointed in Arsenal. Uh, the reason being, City were there for the taking, and I think they were a bit too passive, Arsenal, at times. And if they'd have just had a little bit more guts and really took the game to them, they would have beat them. 
they created the, uh, some great opportunities to equalise uh, and score early on before City scored. And then Skitty, City didn't have that, you know, even though he controlled a lot of the ball, I just thought Arsenal were really timid. And if they'd have been more aggressive, they were, the, the result was definitely there for them. So I was disappointed. Yeah. Really was... disappointed. Yeah, a similar thing. I thought uh, I thought Arteta um, was a bit conservative in, in his tactics, where yeah, normally normally he goes he goes at it and he's clever with the counter attack. There was enough of that. I'm I'm not convinced. Uh, is it Ad, 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 the guy on the left? If for Arsenal, who's the guy on the left for Arsenal? Abamian. Abamian. Sorry, I did yours like ten years ago. Shows where my memory is. Um, City and Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think he's almost wasted on the left at times. He doesn't get in the game enough. And I, I'd like to see him play more of a central role and, and players running off him. Because I think when he's... I know he likes to stay on the left and cutting in, but actually he's not seen enough of the ball. And, and you almost want your best players to be involved more. And at the moment he's not, and he's out the game. And, and against City, I didn't think he did much at all. And I think it's such a shame. He's either got to play centre or go on to search for the ball. A bit like... Um, like Grealish does at times for Villa, he goes out of that left and, and he goes search for the ball. And that might mean your shape mightn't work for a moment or two, but you might create something else. It's taken that risk and reward. And I don't think Arsenal did that enough against City. I agree. You've got to have your, your greatest goal threat in front of the goal. Yeah. I mean, then again, you know, Liverpool with Mane out on the left as well. You, you, you can get away with it if you play the formation right, but Arsenal don't play it that way. And he does just hug the line and doesn't get in front of goal enough. He needs to do it more. And I, I totally agree. That's, I think City are there to be got at. So we've been having a lot of interaction in the last couple of weeks from a, a guy called uh, Rain Chechi is on YouTube or Guy, is, is, his actual name is. And we were talking about the, the, the issues that Man City are having in terms of their recruitment. And he sent us some feedback basically saying his perspective is Guardiola isn't as good as everyone thinks he is. He's inherited these amazing teams. And then what happens is he struggles to coach them. And his perspective was that when they go down or when they struggle, then he goes, he panics on the line. And then that sets everyone else off on the pitch and gets people panicking. I actually thought in this game, same kind of thing happens. He's not happy with the way they're playing. He's getting frustrated. And they're impacted on the park. And you can see that they're worried about what he's saying or what he's shouting or, you know, what he thinks. And I think that really has, has a real impact on what they do. I think City need to build a bit of confidence. I think they need a couple of big wins to get themselves back on the, the, the roads where, where they were last year and the year before, where they were absolutely hammering teams. Right now, they just don't look at it. Don't look half as good as they did. But, but I, think, I think the issue is, is they, they're going out and teams are more savvy now against City because they only play, if you want, one way. And, and it's great to watch when it's on song, but actually when it's not on song, what else can you do? Because teams uh, are getting clever now with, with the tactics and coaches are, are pinpointing certain players for City who trigger certain plays. And I think um, there's a difference between, on the, as a coach, there's a difference between being passionate about your team and losing the plot of your life, one for a better phrase. And I think, you know, if, if you're seeing, if players see you losing the plot on the line, they start to panic with the ball and make passes or make plays that they don't need to make. Um, I think a guy has, has a point in terms of the, t the teams and defence is that um, he's inherited Guardiola. I think the best defences have already been there at the club before he's got there. And that's an interesting stat uh, we, we could look up. Um, but, but I do think it's at a time as well where I, I look at City, I look at Loop, I look at most clubs now, and they don't seem to have a big squad that they used to have in football. You know, I think the squads have been narrowed down to maybe 12 or 13 first or first team players. And then the fringe players seem to be just that. They're not pushing for, for places, I think. Uh, City now, you look at City, you think... They've no longer got four top strikers. Yeah, but and, I think it's become really hard as well to keep though, that level of interest for that many top-class players. Because the other yeah. thing is as well is that people will go elsewhere. People will go and play in other countries. And I'm not saying that that's happening more now than it happened before. But 
what you tend to find now is teams have a really good core of players. And then, as, as you say, everyone else just sits around the outside and then eventually they'll go somewhere else and they'll do the same there. Or they'll force their way into another team on loan and then they'll get bought. But the reality is you stick with your core players because there's so much money in the game. You're so worried about making a mistake or giving a youngster a go that you're, you're not incentivized to do that. I mean, look at, look at the, all the top teams have got some quality youngsters, but look at how many youngsters they've got that are playing every week. There's few, they're few and far between. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's great when you see it happening. It's great when you see it for people like Trent or when you see it for Mason Mount or people along those lines, but they're few and far between. Not, not Mason Mount. <laughs> uh, I picked up on a few things from that game. Uh, I thought, uh, and I usually give him a load of rubbish, uh, Kyle Walker's positioning throughout the game was absolutely outstanding. Uh, but I thought he could have given a penalty away. His foot was really high in the box and he was he was lucky not to give a penalty away. Uh, Arsenal, a couple of times, made the same mistake that he did against Liverpool and didn't beat the press with the passing and created loads of problems for themselves. And then the last one was, your thoughts on it, please, uh, Aguero putting his arm around Sean Massey on the line. And then, obviously, there's a bit of who are in the press about it. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Wound me up, to be honest. It, it wound me up that it got turned into such a big thing. And if you want, if you want the fact that there's a, a woman being uh, a linesman or a third official or a referee or whatever she's going to do, um, and you want her to be treated differently than the men that are in the same position, then you're creating a distinction. And isn't this meant to be about not creating a distinction? I don't think he did anything that he wouldn't have done if that was a man in the position. He didn't do anything, or in my opinion, didn't do anything inappropriate. He put his hand on her shoulder. He talked to her like he would with a, refer a male referee. Put his hand on his shoulder, talked to him. Or you could argue that he should know better and he shouldn't be touching a referee, but it happens all the time. Yeah. The reason it was made a big deal is because it was a woman, and I don't think actually that helped in any way, in my opinion. Uh, I tend to agree, Sai. I felt it was a moment where Aguero, um, he was almost, you know, we've seen this happen across uh, the football for years. You know, Gaza used to do it all the time to officials. What Should he have done it? Maybe not, because the law says don't put your hand on an official. But actually, it was more done like, are you sure that was out? Or are you sure? You know, he didn't try and, 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 and cup her around. He didn't put his hand around the waist. It was on the shoulder, in view. And I just think, in this day and age, um, he knows he shouldn't have done that. But actually, I do tend to agree. I do think it was made more. And, and the media don't help that because they look for a story then. Well, that is, is another interesting one as well. In the, in the derby, um, as Richardson was just about to be sent off, I, can't, I don't know which player it is. It was. I don't know whether it was Seamus Coleman. Or, I, I know it can't have been Coleman. Dina, Lucas Dina. Yeah, he, 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 did, he, did he stick the card back in, his, in the referee's back pocket? Yeah. So he stuck the, the red card, took the red card off the referee, put it back in the referee's back pocket. No one mentioned it. <laughs> and, and, and that's where you've got to look. And that's where you, if they're going to mention that, they've got to mention that. I was busy putting the nets up, so I missed the last part of that. <laughs> yeah, no, but, it was, but that, that's where I think, I think you're creating a distinction that you don't need to create. I, I don't know whether she made a big deal out of it. She didn't see into it at the time. She just brushed it off and carried on. Yeah. She's a, by the way, really good official, does a really good job. But I just think that it just gets blown out of proportion. That really wound me up because again, I, I think they're creating something out of nothing. I yeah. think she's a top top lines person. Uh, I think I think she's brilliant at a job, um, and I think she doesn't want to be treated different. She wants to be the best she can be. Yeah. I don't know the the girl obviously, uh, Sean, um, but I just think let's 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 try and move on it and let's not. Let's hope she, does, she doesn't get offended by you calling her by her first name like you call yeah, everyone you in yeah, football. You don't know her. Well, well. To, to, to be fair, I didn't want to say I don't know, and obviously my circle of friends is of course, different yeah, to your yeah. guys. Yeah, you yeah. Clock, buddy, old and the others. Yeah, Jürgen, Yeah, he's the lovely fella, Jürgen. All right. Well, listen. Let's move across to the other side of Manchester. Well, it wasn't actually the other side of Manchester. It was in Newcastle, but it, the next game was Newcastle versus Man United, and United um, had a decent performance for once. So they beat Newcastle four-one. Shaw scored an own goal. That was a cracker of an own goal, by the way. What was the guy doing? He was just like stuck on the spot. Anyway, uh, and then our mate Maguire scored. Fernandez scored after missing a penalty. Yes. Uh, and then Bissaka scored a whopper and Rashford scored again uh, and they won 4-1. Uh, 
good win for United. I thought they set them set their stall out really well. Newcastle didn't play well in the game, and once United got on top, they were dominant. Yeah, I agree. Well, the same thing happened to what we've been talking about every single week, but this time it was Lindelof ran into midfield chasing after a man got spun, and you know that's what created the goal. He got spun on the halfway line. He created the space. They went down, got it in, and it was caused the own goal. Just yeah. poor, poor defending by Lindelof. It just must be just spreading on them from the other players. Uh, tell you what, who was good? Juan Mata was absolutely yeah. brilliant in that game. Just kept on finding space in between the lines, and they just couldn't pick him up. Just, the defenders didn't know whether to step out and mark him. The midfielders didn't know whether to track him. He was absolutely superb. And they had that donkey on the bench, which was brilliant, Pogba. Absolutely yeah, yeah. brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think Juan Mata's such a clever footballer. Um, and and I, I don't know why he doesn't... He didn't used to get the game time. I think he deserved uh, Juan Mata. But just, just on that, I think that was a massive win for United. I think, I think uh, the management team were under pressure to, to do something. Newcastle are going to be one of them teams who just... Hit and miss, you know, you, you couldn't put them on a coupon because you'd never know what, what you're going to get from them. Um, a typical sort of Steve Bruce, where you think, oh, he's going somewhere, then bang, they're not. Um, but you know what? Yeah. They've had another good result in the week, United. Um, and, and suddenly you're thinking, okay, well, well, are they going to continue this? And then, you know, they'll drop again. They were good. If, they were good in the week as well against PSG. Yeah. I thought they played really well. I mean, PSG were useless, but I thought they played really well. And Rashford's goal was, was yes. an absolute whopper again. Yeah. What a player he is! Yeah, uh, but yeah, I think you're right about Newcastle. I think they will. Uh, they will struggle if they don't start picking up uh, points. Uh, you, 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 you don't. You can't get beat by that United team at Newcastle. Yeah. Um, I, but I do think United played well in that game. They did much better than they've done all year. Yeah, I just think Newcastle are going to str- struggle with goals. I know it's, they just got Callum Wilson scored a couple to begin with, but I don't see them creating enough chances for him to convert. Well, Thomas's mate was, was decent in the game as well, uh, Sam Maximus. He did yeah. really, I mean, he, he did really well on, he's great on the ball. You can't get the ball off him. Um, but I, I just think he's a little bit wasted in that team. Yeah. Also, Newcastle took <laughs> the lead. So, Newcastle uh, at one all, St. Maxim. He knocked the ball in, brilliant ball for Wilson, and Wilson just didn't get enough studs on it to knock it past the Gaia. They would have been two one up. It might have changed the game at yeah, that yeah. point, you know. So he did cre- still create chances, even though they got beat heavily. Newcastle still created chances. All right, I'm just laughing at the fact that Thomas has just said uh, them scoring another goal may have changed the game. He, do you know, he's turned into Ron yeah. Atkinson. <laughs> yeah, him more Michael Owen. <laughs> He's going to have a book out, isn't he? 101 phrases, football phrases. <laughs> All right, we'll get through the next couple quickly because they were boring. Uh, it, this was Sunday. Sheffield United uh, versus Fulham. 1-1. Uh, Sharp and Luckman scored. <laughs> if there was ever a game to skip over, that was one of them. It was absolutely crap. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll skip over it then. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> Crystal Palace, Brighton. Uh, 1-1. Actually, that was a better game. Zaha and McAllister. Um that was a better game, but again, not really that exciting. Anything come up in that game? Not really. Again, we watch it. No, well, I actually, I actually did watch it while I was doing some some work. <laughs> but Brighton again will try and play. Yeah. They try and play all the time, you know. And uh, Palace just dug deep, got got a result. You you will, you know. It sounds stupid, but those teams a draw doesn't do them any good. Oh, all four think, of those teams. Brighton away. I think Crystal Palace at home. That's a bad result for Brighton away. It's not that bad a result. I mean, but I know, but you, you're thinking to yourself, you know, you've got uh, the Fulham and Sheffield United. They both they need points quite quickly yeah, no, to get, yeah, get going, and and they're the teams that the, you need to beat. And a draw, you think it doesn't help. Yeah, I'm with you. I watched that game, man. Palace got given an absolutely ridiculous penalty. I've got no idea what he was given for, and also the referee went to the TV screen and watched it and give the penalty. Uh, it was it was terrible. Uh, Dunk got sent off for a terrible foul in the box. Oh, God, that was bad. Uh, on Kale. And rightly so, uh, he, he's seen red. But rightly so as well, Brighton got the equaliser. Uh, they've been knocking on the door all game. They just don't shoot enough. They yeah. play lovely football all around the box and they just they need to let the ball go and just smash it a couple of times. See what, you know, try your luck. If you don't enter the game, you know, you're not going to win. 
Okay. Hey, 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 that's another one. He's putting them all in tonight, isn't he, hey? <laughs> He's, He's got to be in it to win it. He's going to say next. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm waiting for... Next day, stop it. It's I'm waiting for... Uh, it's a game of two halves, lads, so, you know. Well, you don't win a lot, if you don't buy a ticket, Daz. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What about games of two halves? What's your next game? No, 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 no. What's the next game you're gonna say? Come on. I wasn't. No, I was. I was gonna. I was gonna give the scores for those three games. Oh, go cool, on then. I was gonna. So say. we had um, Newcastle. I had two 0 Newcastle. Thomas had two 0 United, and Darren had two one Newcastle. So me and Darren were wrong. Yeah, so. what do I know? Um, Sheffield United, Fulham. I had one 0 Sheffield United. Thomas had one one, and Darren had two one Sheffield United. Me and Dad's wrong again. I hate Crystal, this theme. Crystal Palace Brighton, I had 1 1, so I was right. Thomas had 2 0 Brighton, Dan had 2 1 Crystal Palace. So I was right on that one. It's a good, good, uh, good mix there. I mean, Thomas was crap last week, so he had to do better this week, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. But to be All fair, right. I think he was drunk when he was given the results the other week. He was, yeah. <laughs> so uh, now that I've ruined Thomas's joke, which I always love doing, this was a game of two. <laughs> <laughs> So this was uh, Tottenham versus West Ham, uh, ended 3-3. Uh, Son and Kane got three early goals. I think it was like 16 minutes or something. They were 3 nil. Yeah. Uh, and then West Ham, amazing comeback. When I say amazing comeback, it, even when they were coming back, it didn't feel like they were coming back because it was just a, because there was no fans in, there was no atmosphere, it was weird. Um, and then Lanzini scored an absolute whopper. Although, did you see uh, Gareth Bale's miss not long before that? Yes, I thought that was going to be in. <laughs> but yeah, that was a, uh, what a what a game that was. Brilliant. Yeah, I think we should go to our leading pundit, Thomas. Can we have your thoughts, please? Uh, well, I thought, uh, one for you, Darren. The first goal for Son, the defending, was absolutely diabolical. So, he's all right foot, Son, playing on the left, cutting on his right. The defender actually moved to his right, to let him go in on his right foot. Open the goal right up for him. Absolutely p- pathetic defending. Great ball by Harry Kane, by the way, through, through to him. Yeah. Uh, second goal, Keane's, uh, Kane's feet were superb. Great movement with his feet. And then the little Meg on Declan Rice before the shot, superb. Uh, but the last goal of what I wanted to talk about was amazing goal. But if you watch the replay... You've got to give the referee some credit. He did amazing to get out the way. Yeah. Literally had to do a quick dance and get out the way of the shot. Superb. What a great comeback. I'm delighted. Yeah, just, just on that first goal, Thomas, what, what gets me about defenders is if attackers run at you, they, they generally run at you with their dominant foot, they, the one they like to play with all the time. And so that should dictate to you where do you want to go on it. Generally, I mean, you have those players and go both sides and, and you know, you just, you just pick a side, you go with it. But you knew, it's like Coutinho used to do it, Salah still does it. They want to come in, they want to jink and get onto the better foot so they can curl it in and, and get the shot away. So why are defenders aren't watching players? Why aren't coaches saying, this is Son, you know, getting examples of when he's running at you. Yeah, Salah, all those players, this is what he wants to do. Keep him out there and we'll double up, we'll bring someone around. Or midfield player, if he is coming across, your job is to close that space. And, and, and with, with Son, I mean, Son's a great player. Him and Kane at the moment are superb together. Some great link-up play. And I just felt, from that point, I thought, Tottenham are going to get five or six here. Because uh, they just looked, West Ham, they'd gone. They'd completely gone. Kane at the moment looks very fit. He's all over the pitch at times. He made a great tackle in his own box and blocked uh, a West Ham shot. Last uh, I, I thought, yeah, that was, I thought it was brilliant. And then Moise got them at half time, West Ham. And I'm thinking, what's he going to do? Maybe he should have stayed at home like he has the last three weeks when they've won. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 so, and suddenly they, they came out and, and they got a bit of confidence. And, but it was only till 80, the 81st minute or something, they, they scored the goal. And you could see Tottenham yeah, at that point, even were like, oh, well, okay, they scored one, oh, we'll be fine. It's, it's not long left. Got a second. And then panic hit them. And then they didn't know what to do. And you could see Mourinho, like, not happy. And suddenly the momentum had shifted, and and, and West Ham were just we just went for it. And that goal, I mean, I, I work with a guy in, in school who's in the other class, and he's an Everton fan, and even he got up and like great goal. You know, when you sit on your couch, you're just like, that's it, what a goal that is. He'll never hit another ball like that in his life. And I liked it afterwards where Graham Soonis was trying to be a goalkeeper, um, 
uh, analyst and he was doing this and, and he was putting his hands <laughs> over his head and, and all sorts. And he has a fair point, to be honest. But uh, interesting, what, what, any goalkeepers we have on Facebook who watch this, were their thoughts on that? Uh, because I think it's, uh, it's changing slightly. Yeah, it, I thought it was, a, it was a great game. Loved it. Although I did switch it off for a little bit and then put it straight back on when Davin text. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was good. Although, you know, Lanzini scored a whopper. But to be fair, he wasn't aiming for that corner. He just hit the ball and it just... I mean, it was almost like he didn't hit it that well and it went round the top corner. Listen, Sam, keep it, if, if you watch the keeper get his hands of it, the keeper yeah. should have saved it. All defenders will tell you he meant to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, funny thing was David Moyes in the interview afterwards was saying when he got the lads back in at half time, he said, I actually thought we'd played really well. He said, Tottenham totally and rightly so got a, the, the big lead after about 20 minutes. He said, but after that, he said, we were creating chances. We had loads of territory. We had loads of ball. We were moving the ball really well. We just hadn't scored. And he thought, if we'd have got a goal in that first half, it would have changed the, the way the game was going. He said, and then second half, he said, you know, I always thought that we were in with a chance. And the lads stuck with me and believed in themselves. And he went on and got a draw. So they're doing something right at West Ham because they're playing some decent stuff at the minute. Can I ask you both a question then? What are your thoughts on Declan Rice? Because in the summer, he was touted to possibly was going for United or someone for 50 plus million. Uh, he's a he's a decent player, but he's not he's not he's not an outstanding. He's he's definitely. Well, I mean, he could be he could be a really good player. He's still young, but he's he's definitely not. He shouldn't be playing at one of the top clubs at the moment. I don't think. I don't think. He's it reminds good. me of. It reminds me of Eric Dyer. Yeah. I just don't think he's that good. Yeah, but he's, he's a big lad. I think he moves around the pitch quite well. But positionally, he's, he's pulled all over the place. That first half, he was poor. He was really poor, and. If he's going to be, you know, challenging for for England on us and to be to be in, in a regular in the England side, he's got to be playing better than that. Surely we've got better players than him at the moment. So what you what you're both saying is like a poor man's Jordan Henderson. That's what I'm getting. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> yeah. Very poor. <laughs> okay, so next game is going to keep you happy, Daz. Leicester at home to your boys, the Villa. Uh, and Villa won one nil with a very late goal from Barkley. What a finish as well! Brilliant finish, to be fair. And and Barkley hadn't been well that week, not trained. Uh, the, the the physio had, uh, worked on him all week to try and get him fit for the game, and uh, he wasn't in the game much. Barkley at all. I, I I thought he was in and out, didn't do much for me. But then, you know, some of his ability when he's playing and and, and he gets the ball, you know, something might happen, and it did. Uh, the, the whole game, I felt, was uh, was nip and tuck. I felt uh, Leicester had some other play. Leicester missed Vardy massively. And I think he makes them tick because what Vardy does is he stretches defences with running beyond uh, defenders into corners in the channels and people hit them and then they get runners. But, but actually, last season, we'd have got beat there 2 or 3 nil without a doubt. I think uh, the fact that we have got Martinez and goal, they had a couple of shots early on and it's just safe hands and you're thinking... We'll let them shoot from 20 yards, 15 yards from that angle because we've got a really solid goalkeeper in. Uh, I just want to mention Konza, who's playing centre-half alongside Mings, who doesn't get the recognition he, he deserves. Konza's been outstanding this season. His positional sense is superb. He's getting up, winning the headers. Um, he's making challenges. He's not afraid to run out the defence and go through the midfield with, with the ball and then make a pass. I just think he's a bit of a, an unsung hero at the moment because Mings used to get all the plaudits. Um, but actually, Konza for me has, has been the better player this season. He, um, he probably has, but the last few games, Mings has really stepped up his game. He's he's made a, he's made a real difference because he's he he imposes himself on the game at centre half. He's winning tackles, he's winning headers, and also he's been pretty good on the ball. Yeah, Mings Mings is is, a, is what I would class as a solid basic sort of centre half, who when he tries to do things out of the ordinary, he gets gets caught. Mm. And, and it's a bit like, um, I don't know, I think Carragher excelled at being basic. So Carragher was an absolutely fantastic centre-half. But when he had to carry the ball out of defence or when he had to try something a little bit different, you could see he was uncomfortable. Mm. Mings has got a nice left foot and he's making better decisions. And part of being a centre-half is those decision-making throughout the game, whether you have to go long sometimes, whether you can go short sometimes. 
uh, whether you can bring the ball out, whether you're given an angle. And, and I felt towards the end of last year, he wasn't doing that well. Uh, but I think he is now. Uh, a shout out again to, to Ollie Watkins for me, who's working tirely, or, or tirelessly up front, not getting an awful lot of chances. But you just think with him at the moment, he might get a chance, one or two chances, he's, he's going to have a shot on goal. Um, so, you know, that if you look at our last two results, I, I was expecting if we get a point out of those two games, we've done okay. We've got six. That's that's just unbelievable. Yeah, done well. So we had, uh, me and Thomas had uh, Villa getting beat in that game by Leicester. I had 3-2. Thomas had 3-0. Yeah, Sammy. it's been noted that, Sammy, Adam by the way. Adam backed his team with a 3-2 win. Yeah. Um, for Spurs, sorry, I forgot to mention that. we had. Uh, I had Spurs winning 3-1. Uh, Thomas had them winning 3 2 and Darren had them winning 4 2. None of us were right there. All right, so uh, the uh, the last two games were Monday, and first one, I mean, there literally is nothing to talk about. West Brom versus Burnley, nil nil. I, I didn't even watch it, I've watched the highlights, but it lasted about 30 seconds, so there wasn't a massive amount to talk about. Yeah, I, I sort of saw them walk out, kick off, walk in, and that was basically the game. <laughs> um, and then uh, the other game, which I actually thought was a decent game, was Leeds versus Wolves. Uh, that finished 1-0 to Thomas's uh, dark horse, Wolves. Uh, Jimenez scored. Uh, I'd love to say that he scored a whopper, but he didn't. He cut inside, did really well, come back on himself, and then mad deflection in past the keeper. Um, but Wolves uh, got a good away win there to, work, to, to Leeds. What did we do? What was our predictions? So our predictions were, uh, I had Wolves, I had Leeds two one, Darren had uh, Leeds three one, and you had Wolves two one, just because you love them. What about the other game? Uh, the other game, oh yeah, we had uh, I had it one one, you had it nil nil. <laughs> Oh, that's why he's asked, Simon. That's why he asked. And I had a feeling I got it right again. 2-1 to Burnley, yeah. Well done. You had I a good week, Tom. well at the weekend, didn't I? Yeah, you yeah. had a good week. When you're um, sober, your predictions aren't bad. But I thought but, Monday was not a, not a great day. Generally, the Monday football is all right, but it, was, it wasn't that great. Uh, I thought Leeds-Wolves was okay, but uh, West Brom-Burnley, absolutely shocking. Uh, yeah, Le- Leeds have got a massive issue now because Phillips is out for about six weeks mm-hmm. and he yeah. makes them tick. He, he, he drives that midfield forward. Um, Leeds struggled, I think, for, for uh, in the game to get decent chances. Uh, I think Bamford up front, although we praised him for the first couple of games, I just think um, he, he didn't hold the player particularly well. Um, it'd be interesting because Villa played Leeds on Friday night to, to go top of the league. <clears throat> Let's move. And... Um, I think they've got a few injury worries leads and I think that might suit Villa again. We've been lucky with COVID so far. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, listen, let's get into, uh, into, into what's happening in the weekend coming up because um, there's loads of good games. Starting on Friday, Daz. The big game. The big game. The big game. Big game of the weekend. Aston Villa versus Leeds at yeah. Villa. Eight o'clock kickoff. Yeah. What are we thinking, Daz? Uh, I think uh, Villa will win, and I'm thinking 2 0. What, you think Villa will win? I don't believe it. I'm on a roll. Thomas? Uh, Villa 2 0. I agree. Calvin Phillips is off for six weeks, like Darren said. The captain for Leeds, the centre half, Cooper, he is touch and go with a groin injury. And. Uh, the other centre half, Pascal Struz or Struick or something like that, they're talking about moving him to a uh, holding centre midfielder for the game because yeah, okay. of injuries. So uh, Leeds will have a good go, but Villa to win. Yeah. 2 0. I'm going Villa 2 1. Can I just say, I don't like it when you two back Villa. <laughs> I know you get worried about that. I'm very worried. Can we not change it? <laughs> All right. So uh, then we get on to Saturday. First game is uh, Man City away to West Ham. I say, I think this could be a really good game because, again, West Ham have built a bit of momentum now. I'm thinking 3 1 Man City. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, side, there's some thought gone into that, hasn't yeah. there? Three, no, 3 1 Man City. 
Uh, City need a desperately need a win, so I, you know, I, I think they've they've got to they've got to go out and go after them. City are currently in fourteenth. That's just bizarre. They're not. That's that's not true. They're not in fourteenth at all. <laughs> that's I'm just a lie. They're eleventh. <laughs> they're eleventh. Um, yeah, they need a win. I mean, I, I, that I know there's only a few games gone in the season, but surely they've got to be looking at that and worrying a little bit. Yeah. All right. What are you thinking, Dad? I think 3 0 to City. Okay. Quite convincingly. So I'm going to go for the upset. I'm going to go 2 1 West Ham. Uh, Fernandinho's out for six weeks. Now with an injury, De Bruyne is out, Laporte's out, and Aki's out uh, for City. So I know they've still got quality. Uh, Laporte should be, you know, he's going to start training next week. So uh, West Ham should be buoyed after that comeback. So 2 1 West Ham. He just goes against the grain, him, doesn't he? He's like he does, that. Yeah. He's a rebel without a clue. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next game is Fulham versus, versus Crystal Palace at Fulham. Absolute snooze fest. Nil nil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I think nil nil. I mean, Crystal Palace don't look good at all. Um, Zaha is. Uh, is Started the season relatively well. I think he scored. He scored five goals already, and he only scored four goals all of last season. Or he scored four and, and, and yeah. scored four last season. But he started the season well. Um, but uh, I just think Palace don't look good. Fulham are absolutely useless. No, no. Thomas, uh, I fancy Fulham for the first three points. Oh, wait, so I, listen to I, I fancy them one nil. I think uh, Palace are absolutely toothless going forward at the minute. I think Zaha played for a move. He was playing out of his skin, scoring them goals. He looked great. They were talking about Juventus and all kinds, PSG coming in for him. Not materialised. He's now, he's nosedived. 1-0 uh, Fulham. I think it'll be a very high-scoring game. 1-0 um, Palace. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right. Next game is probably the biggest game of the weekend. Uh, United uh, versus Chelsea at United. Our five kickoff on Saturday. Um, I think this could be a really good game because uh, Chelsea look good going forward and are poor at the back. United have kicked on in the last week or so. Scored a few goals last week. Looked all right through the week against PSG. And they're not very good at the back either. So I think this could be a high-scoring game. I'm going to go 3-2 United. Ooh. Good shout. Darren? I think uh, the opposite. I think 3-2 to Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if Werner plays in that central role again, with his pace against uh, the United defence, they, they won't be able to live with him. Uh, I think, uh, I do agree, I think it'll be a high-scoring game. So if people who are listening put nil-nil on the coupon... <laughs> but yeah, I think 3 2 to Chelsea. Okay, Tom? Uh, well, Cavani could start on Saturday. Uh, and Tellez, the new left back, uh, he looks like he'd possibly start instead of Shaw. Uh, and they've got a centre half, and they can't say his name. Uh, possibly he may start uh, instead of Lindelof. So I fancy United. I fancy United. I don't think there'll be a lot of goals in it. I think 2 1 United. Okay. All right, and then the evening game on Saturday is Liverpool, Sheffield United at Liverpool. Uh, I think Liverpool will come out the block strong here. So, although I still think we've been shaky at the back, we were not great at the back through the week, other than Fabinho was outstanding. Um, I still think there were some gaps to be exploited. I just don't think Sheffield United have got it in them to exploit them. Uh, I think we'll be on fire going forward, and I think this will be a 3-0 win for Liverpool. I, do we think do we think uh, Thiago will be back? Uh, the rumour is he, he he possibly will be back. Matip possibly has been is back, uh, and the rumour mill today is that Firmino is going to come up the side and Jota is going to start and going to play Mani through the middle. Yeah. So that's the the rumour today. I mean, it's only knocking about on social media and stuff, but you never know. Uh, and I think it'd be a good move to be honest. Jota uh, has had big impact when he's come on in the last yeah, few games. Good. Looks looks really. Really tidy player, so it'd be nice to see him from the start. Uh, Sheffield United have been a bit toothless. I fancy the same. 3-0 Liverpool. 
That's I uh, well, Ryan Brewster play for Sheffield United this weekend, I think, against Come Liverpool. Sun, yeah. But I, I think he'll play only this weekend. There was talk today that he's going to start him. Yeah. Um, so I I think Liverpool will start bright, get at them, get an early goal or two. And I think four 0 Liverpool. I think they'll they'll just try and press high. I don't think uh, Sheffield United have a pace to get beyond uh, Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool in the last game did drop a little bit deeper, which was noticeable. Yeah. Uh, so I think Liverpool have too much for Sheffield United, who can't buy a win at the moment, and I'll go for 4 0 Liverpool. Do you know what? I think you've just hit the nail on the head with regards to the way we'll set up as well. If uh, he plays Fabinho at the back with Gomez, which is likely given that Matip has only just come on back, and we've got extra players in midfield, with Henderson will be probably back in. Um, if he does that, then what happens is Fabinho naturally plays a deeper role than um, Van Dijk does. And he drops off naturally as well. You've seen it in the game uh, yesterday against Ajax. He just naturally drops off. And then what he's trying to do, he's trying to get the defenders running at him as opposed to him chasing defenders, getting in a foot race with defenders in behind him because he knows he's not as fast. But I think actually that does us a favour as long as as we continue to press high as a team, if the midfield presses high and our midfield play well, then that's where we'll, uh, we'll do well in that game. All right, so Sunday, first game is Southampton, Everton at Southampton. Uh, I think this is a potentially a, a good game, but I think tactically this will be a good game. Um, uh, but I still fancy Everton 2-1. Mm. Continue that unbeaten run. No chance. So <laughs> I'm going to beat them 2 0. And I can't wait. <laughs> Not that I'm bitter. He's Not so well. bad. Not He's so well. bad. I think uh, Everton have got a few injury worries. Uh, Hamez is, is, looks like he's a doubt this weekend, which they'll miss. Coleman's out. They'll miss him as well. Um, and, and I tend to. I'm going to turn to err on the side of caution here and go for 1 1. Okay. Oh, bottled it there, Dan, I think. Yeah, yeah, have, yeah. Massively, Thomas, and I'm not afraid to say it. <laughs> All right, next game, Wolves versus Newcastle at Wolves. Um, what are you thinking, Tom? Who am I going to pick here? <laughs> it's either, it's either what, what, what do you call him, Fathead or uh, or your dark horse? Uh, he, has got, he has got a big fat head, hasn't he? Where's it at? <laughs> it's at Wolves. Oh, Wolves. Wolves are going to win. Uh, one nil. With the crowd behind them, this should be a problem, Thomas. There's no crowd. <laughs> what do you think, Daz? Uh, I, I think Wolves will, will do Newcastle um, 2-1. Yeah, I'm going for Wolves 3-1. So I think that's they'll just it. have too much for them going forward. So yeah. And, Newcastle win then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next game is the big game from Sunday, which is uh, Arsenal uh, playing Leicester at Arsenal. Uh, after they got beat by Man City, I think Arsenal will uh, come out strong here. Is Vardy going to be back, Thomas? No idea. Hang on. Rebecca? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Does our Rachel know that you've got Rebecca Vardy on speed dial? <laughs> hey, that's no, fantastic. <laughs> that's sad. How fancy is his phone? <laughs> <laughs> it's called a hands-free. <laughs> um, okay, so I think uh, I think Arsenal win this. Uh, I don't think it'll be that exciting. I think it'll be a two-no win for Arsenal. Does? Uh, yeah, I think it all depends if Vardy plays or not. If he plays, I can see him causing havoc at the back uh, for Arsenal, running the channels. If he doesn't play, I can't see that where they're going to get a goal from at the moment. So uh, I'm going to go two-one Arsenal. Hey, Thomas. Uh, I'm a bit torn here because if Leicester play with their high press and, and put Arsenal under a lot of pressure, Arsenal do struggle against teams that press them really high. Uh, I just think they've got too much quality for Leicester if Vardy's still doubtful. So I'd have to say 2-0 Arsenal. In fact, 3-0 Arsenal. 3-0 okay. Arsenal. Okay. All right. Then we're on to Monday. Uh, first game is Brighton versus West Brom. Uh, it's at Brighton. I think Brighton 2-0. Does? Yeah. I, I can't. Uh, I can't see West Brom doing anything here. However, uh, they, they might scrape something if they get a bit lucky. So I'm going to go for uh, a one-one score draw. Top. One nil Brighton. Okay. And then the last game of the weekend is Burnley um, against Spurs at Burnley. Uh, 
I fancy Gareth Bale to get his first goal in this, uh, and I think Spurs uh-huh. will win 2 0. Thomas? I was going to go side. Okay. I think, yeah, uh, I was going to see Thomas went for. I, I think I'm going to go for. I think Tottenham will batter them. I, I think it'll be something like 4 0. Okay. I'm going to agree with Simon, unfortunately. 2 0, Tottenham. They look good, Spurs. Just can't mm-hmm. hold it at the back, can they? What, what's yeah. interesting is Kane's dropping into that almost Firmino role and getting Son uh, running beyond them. I mean, get, get Bale the other side doing the same. That's going to be amazing. As you said, that is, is the, their partnership looks fantastic. And I think the best thing about it is, is that um, Son is doing an awful lot of the running for Kane, which then is allowing Kane to do, influence the game more into dropping into the Firmino role and picking the ball up. And I, and I think actually when he gets the ball in there, his pass is unbelievable. He's a, he's a really good footballer on his day. He's a clever footballer. And out from outside the box, 18, 20 yards out, you know, he's, he's as good as anyone around. Yeah, and in the air as well. He's great in the air. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, they're, they're looking good at the moment. And I think Bale is a good addition for them. So they're yeah. only going to get better. Okay, so uh, that's it for the weekend. I think it'll be a good weekend. Um, looking forward to the games. Uh, so let's, uh, let's move on to the, uh, the reason why people actually listen to the podcast. Because we kid ourselves that it's me and you. Yeah, every but week. The reality yeah. is that it's got nothing to do with me. I don't even know whether people know we're on it anymore. Um, but the the people generally come to listen to Thomas. I lo- I like the build up. Thanks yes. for that. Yeah. No, so who, no not Thomas. Who are you mostly hating this week? Well, you don't know. So uh, let's I have a go. Know. See if you can get it. Uh, <laughs> this week, I'm mostly hating someone who has represented England at I don't know how. At under sixteen, under seventeen, under eighteen, under nineteen, and under twenty one levels. Over the last year or so, he's been an England regular. He plays in the Premier League for a small club with even smaller ambition because they think they're one of the big boys. Any guesses who it is? No idea. Okay, so this week I'm mostly eating Jordan Pickford. (laughs) (laughs) He made his name at Sunderland but had loan spells at various lower division teams. He wanted to reach the dizzy Premier League sooner but couldn't reach those dizzy heights because of his short arms. (laughs) A club in desperation took a gamble on him and paid £25 million, which, in my opinion, is overpriced by about £25 million. <laughs> He made his first team debut at Sunderland against Arsenal in the FA Cup, and he lost 3-1. He then made his Premier League debut against Tottenham and lost 4-1. So in his first two games, he conceded seven. And still, Everton wants to pay £25 million for him. I haven't watched the goals, but I presume at least five of them were just out of his reach. (laughs) In 2017, he was named on the shortlist for the PFA Young Player of the Year. I presume shortlist because he's a midget. (laughs) To be honest, he'll never be on the long list, will he? (laughs) The third most expensive goalkeeper in history at the time. Apparently, he would have been the first but the price was based on the length of his arms. He just fell short again. <laughs> At the end of the 2017-18 season, he was named Everton's Player of the Season. Along with numerous other accolades, this just shows you how poor Everton were at the time. At one point, he was my favourite goalkeeper. I remember the moments as if it was yesterday. He mishandled the volley from Virgil van Dijk and the luckiest football player around, Divock Origi, scored the header to win the game in the 96th minute in the derby. A beautiful moment for all Jordan T-Rex Pickford fans. (laughs) He makes that many mistakes, he should be sponsored by (laughs) Tipex. So for playing for Everton and having short arms and generally thinking that you're better than you are, and finally, for the savage attack, injuring the big man Virgil van Dijk, Jordan Pickford, you are on my wall of hate. Yes. Alienated all of our Everton. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That was okay. a good one. Yeah, yeah, that was that was good. Some of some of your best one liners in there. Stepping <laughs> up the last couple of weeks, I like it. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Oh God. <laughs> he has got very little arms though, hasn't he? Yeah. That's not a joke. He actually has got really small arms. I wonder how long his arms actually are. 
I reckon they're from about um, the tip of his finger to like the top here. <laughs> to his shoulder. <laughs> to his shoulder. <laughs> All right. So there's a couple of things we want to talk about before we get done. Right. Firstly, um, we want to talk about Daz's mate or our mate, Phil McGuinness, um, who is... Uh, who is just about to star on Netflix? Um, what's the what's it called, Thomas? The the program that he's or the uh, the programs that that he's in. I forgot. You know what my memory's like. Adam, what's it called? I think it's the Alienist, uh, which is on. Yeah, yeah it's Alienist. on. It's on Netflix, and the series is available to 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 stream straight away. It's not coming out like each week. Um, he's in episode I think two and five. He's a local lad. He's from Liverpool, from the Kirby area, and it's great to see him. Uh, doing a few things, uh, high profile at the moment, and um, I'm absolutely delighted for him because he works. You know, people think this acting business is easy. You just turn up, you do it, and away you go. And, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, I found it difficult in his limousine and his jet when we, <laughs> when we went to Kirby Golf Course and uh, he hired the whole thing out. I thought that was very suave of him. But no, he's a great guy, even better actor. And uh, I'm proud that he, I call him a mate and, and he listens to this podcast. So I'm hoping I'm his, in his book when he makes it famous as the little fat fellow who helped him. And listen, if he forgets us when he's famous, I won't be happy at all. Although Surely. we will, he's, no, he's told me he's forgetting me. No, I'm his bad carrier. He told me. And if we play golf, I can come along as his caddy, but not to speak to him. <laughs> I've seen a picture of him with that Stephen Gray. I was thinking, he, he's, he's getting a bit big time there, isn't he? Well, he was in, that's called uh, Being Keegan, which is yeah. on... Um, I think it's on iPlayer or something, or I'm no, sure it'll... it's on uh, the f- uh, Amazon Prime, is it? Amazon, Amazon Prime, Prime yes, yeah. well done, Thomas. It's on Amazon Prime, Prime, yeah. I'm going to go. Um, so, Brian Keegan is in, a, is in a, a, a scene with Stephen Graham, another local Liverpool lad from Kirby. Um, so, it's great to see these... These I'm a massive fan of regional accents on, on telly, because I just think it's losing it. So, uh, Phil's doing a great job, and I'm really proud of him. Yeah, that's Phil McGuinness uh, in The Alienist on Netflix. The only problem is, he's an Evertonian. So he is, but we don't hold that against him. Well, you do. No, Thomas does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, but he's a good lad. He, he's always uh, shouting out the podcast as well. And uh, we're going to get him on. Yes, we are. We're going to get him on. I've just got to speak to his agent who wants 20% of nothing. So I'm going to work on that. <laughs> if, if we have to pay him, I swear I'm going to fall out with you, Daz. <laughs> it's been lovely doing this, Sai. <laughs> Yeah, no, it'll be good to get him on, um, get a blue on, put him up against Thomas. All right, so a couple of other quick things before we go. Now, we'll make these quick fire. Let's not get into too much detail. Um, the first one is, how about Ozil being left out of Arsenal's Premier League squad and now starting to kick off about it? He's uh, broken his silence and basically said, Arsenal have left him out in the cold. They're not supporting him. Uh, and then that... Um, Nathan Niles. And I don't know whether he meant it to sound this way, but he said, uh, we'll talk to him when we get back to the training ground. So for me, <laughs> I thought someone's going to give him a kicking. But I don't know whether it means that. But yeah, they, uh, you know, he's earning, what, 300,000 a week? And he's just been paid millions as uh, some sort of loyalty bonus. Eight million pounds. Eight million pounds as a loyalty bonus, and he isn't playing. Crazy. One, I just think if, if you... Four weeks. Yeah, if you want to play football, move. Go to a different club. And Arteta has got well within his rights. He's not played for so many years, earning that much money. If he wants to go, get him out, move him on. That's my my take. I think that's the problem, though, isn't it? Is that he's he's paid that much money that that move would be really difficult because he's not playing. He's not proven at that kind of level now. <clears throat> so to get to command three hundred thousand again, he's not going to get it. So he's going to just going to sit and, and get paid, which is well, ridiculous. Well, then for me, he can't moan. Yeah. Simple as that. But you know he's got an assist record for Arsenal. Like in the history, yeah. he's got one of the he's got the highest assists. Yeah, he, he assists with he the assists bags, with he the assists stuff. with the kit, he assists <laughs> with the water bottles. He does lots of assists. <laughs> Move on. Yeah. <laughs> the jokes don't get any better, even if it is his birthday. Okay, so the other one is uh, Mason Greenwood uh, seems to be going off the rails a little bit. Any thoughts on it? So we, we said a while ago. Let's not give them too much crap. They're young lads. They've been given a whole load of money. They're, some of them don't deal with it as well as others. But apparently United have um, sat down with him and, and warned him about his conduct and because of all the stuff that's gone on. But also he's been turning up to training late and stuff as well, um, as in figured in the last couple of squads. Any thoughts on uh, a young lad like that getting into that much trouble? 
Yeah. Thomas, go on. I, do you not think it reminds you of how the press acted around Sterling when he was a young, when he was a lot younger? Now, you've got the likes of your <laughs> captain, Darren, at, at Villa, uh, who's been in scrapes and stuff that hasn't been reported in the press and stuff. But is it just because he's a young black lad that he's being singled out and it's being highlighted? He's an, he's an amazing talent. He could go on to be one of the best players in the country, uh, the way he's come onto the scene. He's a young lad. You know, my daughter makes mistakes every day. She's 20-odd. She's late for work. She does this, that, and the other. It's just normal youth behaviour. And I don't think there's anything wrong in it as long as people are making sure that he doesn't make a mistake that's going to haunt him for the rest of his life. It's just general, everyday, normal youth behaviour. Whether you're on 100 grand a week or £9 an hour in Tesco, you know, you're going to make them mistakes. Let them get on with it. I think the issue, though, for me, Thomas, is that um, if you're young like he is and, and almost like he's in the media eye all the time, they look looking for things all the time. And I think, you know, you've got to set your standards. And if you're not setting your standards, uh, you know, if you look at Fergie was at United, he wouldn't have been late. because, And also it would have been kept in-house if people were late. Things go on in football clubs that, you know, even I don't know. And, and you know my links and my friendships. <laughs> but there's things go on. There's things going on at football clubs that you'll never know until the 35 and release the book. Yeah. Well, and, and so, so, it, so here's, the, here's the thing. As I, I, as I was looking at this, I was thinking, so I, I think the same as Thomas. I think the, the, the lad's 20-odd years old. He's going to do stupid stuff. That's just the way it is. And unfortunately, his stupid stuff is in the public eye. But it's going to happen. But... I, I almost thought straight away, is this because Ollie's there and they've not got a more experienced manager to get a grip on some of the young lads and say, okay, you, you can't make those obvious mistakes. And things like turn up late seems like a really obvious thing. And it can't have been he's just turned up late once or it wouldn't, it wouldn't have come out. This is obviously a, a theme. And Ollie's a, a young manager, uh, hasn't got the experience. Um, you know, and, and, and maybe he hasn't got the credibility with some of the players as well. Some of the younger players probably don't even know what he did for the club. Yeah, I, yeah but I just think, though, you, you, you're respecting, you've got to show respect to, the, to your teammates and, and other people. You can't just, this hasn't been a one off occurrence. If this has happened numerous times, I guarantee if Roy Keane was in charge or someone of that ilk, he'd have a different mentality. And I think this isn't this, though, what United have done now over the last 12 to 18 months. They've got no captain in terms of um, who, who was steering the ship, whether that was Ferguson, Keane, you know, all those great players in the day who were saying, get here, get yourself sorted or ship out, because actually he could end up in two years, three years' time playing the championship. Yeah. It, it, because of that. And, and you, look at, you look at other players who have, who have nearly been there. And, and Greenwood, although he's a, he's a great prospect, he's not proven. He's had some good games, he's got some good, good goals. He's still not proven. And I think at this moment of time, he's at a crossroads, like Sterling was, and Sterling turned it round. He got a move and, he, and he's come on heaps and bounds. But I think Greenwood's got to be very careful he doesn't end up. Um, this is the career now he can have or the career he ends up with. Yeah. I think he, he needs someone to put his, the, their arm around him, but at the same time... Not Aguero, mate, because you're getting so much crap for that. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, that was a good one. <laughs> but at the same time, people need to accept that he's a young lad and he's going he's gonna to get things wrong. Um, while we're talking of United, uh, the other thing that happened this week was, as a follow-up to Project Big Picture, United and Liverpool uh come out and or rumors started coming out about the european premier league and apparently united and liverpool are driving the possible creation from a uk perspective um we i think we said last week unfortunately it was looking liverpool and, and united were looking like bullies in the way they were trying to push project big picture but thomas you did make the point that this was the next step it was a prelude to this Hmm. Uh, and then within days, obviously, it comes out. Any thoughts on, uh, on what's come out this week, Tom? I think well, it's always... this Somewhere down the line, it's always going to happen. So most of the big clubs are owned by billionaires. Uh, and unfortunately for the likes of... I mean, Liverpool's owners have been fantastic for us, and I don't, I don't want to slag them off, but they're, they're from American sports. 
and in America they are all about looking after themselves and ripping everybody off and getting as much money in as they possibly can. And they've tried it a few times in Liverpool and, and they've had to pull back on a few things where they'd put the price up for season tickets and then Spiritus of Shankly have dived in and said, what are you doing? And then there's been mass cryouts and stuff. I think eventually there is going to be a Super League because people want to see it. And whether we say we don't, you know, I think it's going to turn out to be more like we're going to get rid of the League Cup eventually down the road. We're going to play our league game on a Saturday or a Sunday. And then on midweek, we're going to play in our Super League, our Super League game, our European Super League game. The Champions League will be gone and we'll be in two, two leagues. And the top teams from around the world will be in there. And it'll be the midweek, Tuesday and Wednesday game. And I think there's, whether it comes now or in the next five years, it's definitely going to come. It is down to greed. But I think for all people are saying they don't want to see it, I'm sure that you'd love to see Liverpool have a guaranteed game every Wednesday against one of the top sides in the world and then play Burnley on the Saturday. You know, see, I disagree, Thomas. I wouldn't want to see that because I think it takes away the, the special nature of it. Um, I totally disagree with uh, having a super European or world league because if you think, if you're playing in Brazil on the Wednesday night, you're not getting back and uh, till into this country till Thursday, Friday or whatever, and then you're playing Saturday. The whole thing is set up for certain clubs to get richer and actually not really consider that all about football. I, I don't want to see Super League. I love to see those special nights, whether it's at Anfield, Old Trafford, you know, anywhere, hopefully Villa Park in the next five years. Those European nights are special. You know, if you ask a Liverpool fan what nights they remember the best, under the floodlights, at Anfield against the top European side, Barcelona last year or the year before, was it? St. Etienne, it still gets talked about in the city. You know, if you look at all those, they're special. And what you do, if you normalise it, fans will just not go. They won't go to, 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 to Brazil to watch them. And they say, no, they've got Liverpool fans, I've got, Liverpool, I've got fans in Brazil. And what? And what? They've got to remember where they're from. The, the clubs, it's interesting that United and Liverpool are the only clubs who want to tout for this. And it is because I think there's, there's American ownership in there. And, but I do think, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. And if, if they come to a point where they've got to decide between the Premier League and the European Super League, that's when you'll realise, actually, what do they want? Because so I wouldn't I, allow them back. I don't, I don't think it is just Liverpool and no, United. Not. So there's more teams. But I, I take your point, doesn't I? I, I, get, I, think, I don't think Thomas is disagreeing either. I, I, don't, no. I like the thought of playing the best teams in, in the world. But I don't like the thought of, of, of it becoming a replacement for what we already have. Um, I, I don't think the League Cup does us any favours at all. I think that could go away tomorrow, no problem at all. You certainly wouldn't want to lose the FA Cup. And I, and I think they could probably do some things with the um, European Cup or whatever they want to call it going forward to make it a little bit more exciting and a little bit less monotonous. Um, but... In it, it, they could come up with a format that works really well. They don't need to create this league. But I think Thomas's point is that no matter what you what, what we want, and we talked about it. Um, I remember when Liverpool uh, were talking about the Fairlow and staff, and we were saying that the reality is, a, it's a business, and b, it's owned by billionaires who who don't. Although they like to talk about the history of the club and all that, the reality is, it's all about making money. And if they don't make money, they're not interested because they're business people. So if this becomes a, an opportunity for them to make money and they don't see a negative in terms of the financials, that, then I find it difficult to believe that they would decide not to do it or not pursue it in some way. Yeah. And the other thing, Darren, is they're initially, they're not looking at bringing teams in from Brazil. So they're still going to keep it as a, as a, like a European. I don't think them teams from... Brazil and Argentina, I don't think they're up to their standard of playing. The likes of our, our top European sides, we can make out. I don't think they, they, I don't think the challengers, if I'm being honest. Uh, but the so you're, you're talking about your massive team. So Real Madrid are pushing for it. Liverpool and Man United. You're looking at Paris Saint Germain. You're looking at the 18 Inter, Juventus. You're looking at they're looking at the the, the the clubs that have been the elite for the last 20, 30, 40 you know, Real Madrid 50, 60 years uh, of world football. They're looking at them elite to say, 
you're going to play. You're not going to play your uh, fourth team out of the German league, Hoffenheim or whoever it is, you know, at the moment. Uh, you won't be playing them. You're going to be playing the marquee top teams. Now, I, I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just saying yeah, what, what they're going to do to sell it as, as a, to the fans to say. As a do you want to be, Yeah, as a spectacle. Do you want Liverpool to be playing Juventus on the Wednesday? Then the following week, you've got Real Madrid. The week after that, you've got Inter Milan. Then you've got Bayern Munich. And that's how the league rolls. And, and that, yeah, but, but, that's, 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 I can just see it coming off. I'm not saying I agree with it. But I can see as a business, you know, and a selling point, it will make billions. And the teams will make millions and billions. And in fact, what, what it'll probably do is, it'll probably... Uh, grow the sides because they're going to have to. They're going to have to have a squad big enough to play Premiership football on on a weekend and then European football every week. They're going to have to grow the side. They have to grow the squads to make this the better. But, 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 but what what we're hearing all the time is, and I, I'm I'm just voicing this here is they play too many games. That's what Absolutely. I hear all the time. Yeah, yeah. So, so don't counteract. Not you, Thomas or Sam, but don't whoever he's organising these things. Don't say. Oh, actually, we're going to counteract that. We'll get rid of the League Cup. Well, that's fine. They don't come into the third round anyway. They pull up out the second team. So that really doesn't have an issue. The League Cup can go to championships teams and, be, and, and lower down and let them have a, that League Cup if you want. What I'd love to see is, do you know the Hoffenheims of this world and, and the Nottingham Forest of this world who actually won the European Cup twice, didn't they? That's what I want to see. I, I, I want to see the romance of the, of the European Cup come back. I want to see a knockout. And, and, and I want to see it when it was harder to win, if that makes sense, coming through. Where if you got, when Forrest won the European Cup, they had to beat Liverpool in something like the second or third round. Yeah, yeah. And that was massive, because Forrest weren't a big club at the time. I want to see that, because actually, that makes it, for me, a better competition. What I don't want to see is this elitism in sport, that they look after themselves, the 12 clubs across Europe look after themselves and no one can get in, no one can break that. So how does anybody come in and break that? So we're talking about the, over the last 20 or 30 years, the Man City not going in. That's what I'm I, asking. I don't, I don't know, Darren. I know people. you don't know, but what I'm saying is... Apparently, the top, the top five teams in, in, in England or the, the five biggest clubs at the moment are the five that are being considered to go in. Obviously, Man United. And well, that Liverpool. works out well because Everton, Villa, and Liverpool <laughs> yeah. are all t- are top three. So, obviously, we're right up there. I, I, I agree with it. Let's carry on. Like, definitely. But so, hang on. Let's go back to the comments about um, Nottingham Forest because I think that's a good one. Here, herein lies my problem with the European competitions as they stand today. They let too many in. Yeah, it's pointless. It's not the Champions League. It's not the champions of the uh, of of Europe playing against each other. It's the champions, plus the second, third, and possibly fourth place, and in some cases fifth. Yeah. Um, it, it's it, it gets a bit ridiculous, and and I think it's gone too far. It, I think one of the things that I think they could do to make the the European Cup the European Cup again is go back to the top two. Yeah, go back to just just the top two. Go in. Don't let anyone else in. It's all about the top two, and then have the. The, whatever the second European competition c- can get the next four in, I don't care, whatever it is, but the, the Champions League or the European Cup should be about the best teams in Europe. In that season. Yeah, but, and, but, and, but I don't think, but I, I, again, I don't think that solves the problem that you're highlighting, Daz, about, about the romance of it, because none of those teams are going to get in if that was the case. The reason that you have some weird ones in, like, you know, you, you Leicester Malmo. in there, yeah. yeah. Or but Leicester were in there, and then and then you'll get teams that are pushing for it. You know, Watford might get a spot, or Wolves might get a spot, and Wolves did really well. Um, the only re- reason that's happened is because we're now getting like six teams going into Europe. Yeah. Well, I don't know whether that is the right thing to do. I agree, so I don't think it is the right thing to do. I, I think it does need to go if you want an elitism. Okay, have an elitism, but have it the top two from every every league, because that way, do you know what? Every three or four years, it's going to be a different top two, possibly. And, and that's okay, yeah. because it gives everyone a chance. Leicester got in it one year. What a, that would have been brilliant to see Leicester v Real Madrid. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's what you want to see. But it would, have been, see. it would have been much better if there wasn't another three teams yeah. in that cup. Yeah. Because Leicester yeah. had won the league. But yeah. again, going back to all that, is down to money. Yeah. Because they've made more money having United scraping in, in fourth than it would have done having Leicester in there. 
because United are a bigger draw. Yeah. So, you know, sponsorship and everything else goes higher because you've got better teams in there. And they need them huge teams to, to get the sponsorship deals in. Well, yeah, but what I'm, I'm saying is... I yeah, understand yeah. what you're saying, but that's why they've gone to four because there was too many occasions where Real Madrid had a couple of scenes where yeah. they were rubbish and Atletico Madrid were challenging Barcelona. So Real Madrid not being in the Champions League, oh no, let's, no. let's go to three teams in the Champions League. Then the year after, another team were really struggling with in third. Oh no, we're going to lose this team. Let's get them in. Well, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't quite work like that. But I tell you, we may not agree with it, but it's coming because FIFA, FIFA are pushing for it. They want that revenue out of UEFA's hands and they want it in their own pockets. And it's FIFA that are pushing this world, uh, this European Super League or whatever it is. It's the them Premier that are pushing League. it and want to take over it. Is Thomas, it they call it the European Premier League or something like that? Somewhere. Yeah. I so wanted Thomas to do a Kevin Keegan rant then. And I felt we missed something there, Thomas. Do you know what? I'd love it. I'd love it if Real Madrid beat you. <laughs> All right, well, listen, let's, let's put it to bed. But that might be a good one, Daz, to throw up on the uh, Facebook page to get some feedback as well, see, yeah. see what people think about it, because uh, I think we'll get some good feedback there. All right, so that'll, uh, that'll do us. We, we were going to do a relatively short one. We've been on forever, as always. It, it never, never turns out the way Darren's fault, yeah. All right, so just to make it a little bit longer, Daz, what are your final thoughts? Uh, I just want to say a little shout out to uh, a friend of the podcast, Laura Watson, who's getting married next Tuesday. I wish her all the best. She's a Leeds fan, so I'm going to text her on Friday to make sure Villa, uh, after Villa have won, sorry. And if Villa don't win, I don't want to see her for about three weeks. <laughs> all the best, Laura. Thomas? Uh, I, I think uh, Liverpool should go in this European Super League. <laughs> 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 yeah thanks perfect all right so uh you know you can download the podcast from google Podcasts, apple Podcasts, spotify tune in network um we're all, everywhere everywhere you want us um or you can watch us on youtube and laugh at darren's uh ridiculous faces when he gets excited um <laughs> But also log on to the website if you want to catch up on some of our previous episodes. Website is www.twomenandfootball.com. Uh, and also go and have, if you haven't watched it or listened to it already, go and listen to the Billy Birch podcast because we had an absolute laugh on that. Um, he was a great guest and we'll get him back again. On, uh, unfortunately, we'll have to see him. Oh, no, we don't have to see him Saturday. That's a bonus. Yeah, we've got no game. Excellent. Well, it's no South, excellent South, game. South Liverpool won at the weekend for all those that are following South Liverpool. Uh, 3-1 win, Darren. Yes, 3-1 win. Um, we, we dominated the game, just couldn't seem to put the ball in the back of the net. Well, so 3-1 win, that's all. Top of the league. Keep it going, Daz, keep it going. All right, thanks everyone for listening. See you on the next one, lads. Take care. Bye-bye. See ya.